From the outside, Cafe Canal looks like just another trendy cafe. It's surrounded by well-known New York City neighborhoods like Soho, Tribeca, and Chinatown. The pastries look delicious. And tourists might not notice the double N in Canal and the iconic leaf next to the name. They claim the title, New York's first CBD cafe and lounge. CBD, as in cannabidiol, is one of the active ingredients of cannabis. Thank you. The staff's really friendly and happy to entertain questions. My name is Anna. I'm a shift manager here, and I love working with CBD and cannabis. I love it. So you get a lot of very variety of people, people who've already smoked, people who've never smoked before, people who want to try it for the first time, who are like baby new to CBD. Our baking section consists of brownies, and then we also have um, a blueberry dream crumble cake, which is fresh blueberries inside. Um, sugar crumble on top. It's very, it's not that sweet, but it's super good. Anwuli Obidi is the chef behind the cafe's inviting menu. We wanted it to be kind of like a judgment-free, safe space for people that are curious about CBD or interested in CBD or even use it. We want uh, people to be able to benefit from it without any stigma attached to it. Now, not everyone comes here for the weed. Some just want coffee, for real. Like Tony from Toronto, who steers clear of cannabis these days. The psychoactive effects started to kind of be a bit too much for me. It's almost like inside of you, your brain, there's a positive voice and a negative voice. Anytime I consume any type of THC or CBD or cannabis, it seems to just bring out the ne- gives the negative voice a microphone. <laughs> cannabis, many know it as marijuana, used to be associated with the counterculture movement of the 1960s. But when did it become so mainstream? Well, with more states legalizing it and a federal proposal to make it legal nationwide, more people are using it. But do they know what they're taking? And what about the claims about all its benefits or its risks? Isn't it harmful, addictive? How about instead of getting your information from your local barista, we find out what science has to say about cannabis. This is Nova Now. And to be blunt, this is your joint for rolling through the science behind the headlines. I'm Alok Patel. And if this episode gets you fired up, you should check out Nova's hour-long film, The Cannabis Question, streaming on the PBS video app and Nova's YouTube channel. To set us straight on what exactly cannabis does to your brain and body, and what people are using cannabis for now, we have bi-coastal experts. I am Yasmin Hurd. I am the director of the Addiction Institute at Mount Sinai in New York. I am a neuroscientist. My name is Ziva Cooper, and I am the director of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative. And I'm also an associate professor in psychiatry and anesthesiology at UCLA. So let's start with some definitions. Cannabis came to be called marijuana, partly to stir up anti-Mexican sentiment, and the name stuck. We're using its scientific name, which is now favored by many. Cannabis is the plant. There are many different cannabis strains of plants. The main strains you might have heard of are indica, sativa, and ruderalis. Cannabis comprises hundreds of different chemicals that can have various effects on the brain and the body. It has over 140 cannabinoids and other chemicals, including terpenes. Terpenes are what give a plant flavor and scent. And unique combinations of terpenes give each cannabis strain a different aroma. Cannabinoids, the name comes from cannabis, are little molecules that interact with an important system in our body, the endocannabinoid system. We have a natural um, cannabinoid receptors, and they're found in the brain and the body. What people may not know is that our bodies naturally produce their own cannabinoids that bind to receptors throughout our bodies and do a variety of things. So they mediate, for example, immune function, they mediate pain, um, they mediate anxiety. They're critical for regulating how the, the neurons speak to each other. They regulate the synapse over which transmitters cross from one cell to the next. And so they regulate practically every neurotransmitter system in the brain. So they have a very profound, broad effect on cognition in terms of memory, emotional regulation, um, motor activity. They are you know, really critical for all of these fundamental functions in our brain and in our bodies. 
This system is integral to the functioning of our bodies, so it's easy to understand why cannabis can affect us in so many different ways. And so when we hear about how cannabis might be therapeutic, it might be medicinal, it might be helpful for one of 700 indications, what is it that people are talking about? So we can't just refer to cannabis as one plant. We have to think about the different chemical constituents that act very differently in the brain and body to potentially exert both the potential medicinal effects as well as having potential adverse effects that we should be very mindful of. But we don't know much about these effects. There's actually not as much research as people would like to think about cannabis. Of the over 140 cannabinoids, we really have only studied two, and one of them more predominantly. Right now, we have the most information about the chemical constituent called delta-9-tetrahydrocannabinol. Better known as THC. THC is the cannabinoid that um, induces the high. More recently, we've been hearing a lot about another cannabinoid. CBD or cannabidiol is another cannabinoid, and that is a non-intoxicating cannabinoid. There's also a lot of variability to consider, like in the concentration of the CBD or THC in the cannabis you're studying. And it turns out that obviously dose matters. We don't see the same effects at these at higher doses. And also the ratio of, the, of THC to CBD makes an impact. So when people say we understand cannabis, We understand aspects of THC in a particular dose range, and we understand certain aspects of CBD. There are about 140 cannabinoids, and there are over like 400 other chemicals. And that interaction, to study them one by one, and to study the interaction, we still don't know so much. Many people in our society think, oh, you know, Cannabis has been studied for decades. We know it's safe. We know it's good. We actually have not studied cannabis for decades. Um, Not in in the level, at least, that we can make, you know, concrete, evidence-based decisions that guide medicine. Ziva Cooper was a member of the National Academies of Sciences Committee on the Health Effects of Cannabis. In 2017, the committee published an almost 500-page consensus report on the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. Only about 50 pages of it was related to the therapeutic effects of cannabis and these chemical constituents in the cannabis plant called cannabinoids. The rest focused on negative aspects of cannabis, especially addiction. And that's the focus of Yasmin Hurd's research. We know that about 30% of people who use cannabis will develop a cannabis use disorder, meaning a clinically diagnosed disorder. That's about the same percentage as for other drugs like cocaine, for example, or heroin. Over the years, advances in production have made the cannabis that's consumed more potent. We now have a higher concentration of THC. And we know that the higher the concentration of THC, the greater the possibility of developing an addiction. But it's difficult to predict who will develop a disorder. The person sitting next to you could consume the same amount of drug, but they have certain differences, whether it's in their genetics, their environmental upbringing, or just what might be in the cannabis that they consumed versus what you consumed. And that's enough to make them have a cannabis use disorder and you not. But it is Russian roulette. You don't know whether or not you're gonna be that person to develop not only an addiction, some people develop psychosis or anxiety disorders or depression. So that's a challenge for us in in science and medicine is being able to identify those people who would be at greater risk versus those who will be resilient. What happens when someone develops cannabis use disorder? Well, one of the initial effects of cannabis use is an increase in dopamine, a neurotransmitter associated with pleasure and reward chronic cannabis use can alter our endogenous opioid system. The use of the cannabinoids over time, their receptors actually become tolerant. So the cannabinoid receptors need more and more of THC. So people start taking more of the drug. And the more they take, cannabinoid receptors actually are inhibitor receptors. So they shut down certain circuits. So over time, they start to shut down circuits that may be critical for cortical functioning in terms of decision-making, cognitive effects, and memory. 
and they increase stress responsivity. So initially, many people think, oh, cannabis decreases my anxiety. But that's when they're taking low amounts and in the beginning. And over time, it increases their anxiety stress response. So it is changing of the cannabinoid receptors. And I was wondering if you could talk to us about the effects of cannabis on the developing brain and the endocannabinoid system. I mean, the brain doesn't fully develop until our mid-20s. So what should we be worried about here? We look at prenatal THC and we see both in children who are exposed prenatally to cannabis that they show early signs of comorbid psychiatric vulnerability early in life. You can see it months after in childhood and this anxiety propensity, you know, aggression propensity, ADHD propensity. So this is one thing that we really must be clear that the developing brain is very vulnerable. The endocannabinoid system is critical for hard wiring of the developing brain. During development, it lays out the foundation for the pathways that are created. So if our children are being exposed during that developmental period to cannabis, that has profound impact. Leading to vulnerabilities to psychiatric problems that emerge when they're adults, says Yasmin Hurd. From animal studies, she and her team have made a couple findings. It's THC that's inducing these long-lasting effects into adulthood. But we still don't know about CBD and the developing brain. And, you know, we'll, we'll know that in a couple of years. So there's good reason for caution. But also... There's optimism in terms of cannabinoid-related products for medicine. Well, we have to start off with the only FDA-approved <clears throat> cannabis medicine today... CBD for the treatment of two um, pediatric rare forms of epilepsy. Some children suffer from severe seizures that don't respond to conventional treatments. A CBD-based drug called Epidiolex is now available to help tame the irregular brain activity that causes these seizures. Epilepsy, it's this imbalance between our inhibitory um, cells and the excitatory cells. And so you have such hyper excitability. And CBD, Epidiolex, um, reduces the excitation of these cells. But we still don't know what's the mechanism by which CBD actually does this. Yasmin Hurd and her lab have been studying how chemicals in cannabis can be used to treat opioid addiction. To better understand the effects of prenatal THC exposure, Hurd's team gave pregnant animals THC and followed their offspring into adulthood. Animals that were exposed to THC during prenatal life, they would self-administer more heroin, especially during stressful conditions. And we would see similar thing with adolescent um, THC exposure. Hurd wondered if these effects extended to other cannabinoids, like CBD. We were surprised to find actually some of the opposite effects that we were seeing that CBD actually reduced heroin-seeking behavior, at least in our animal models. Importantly, the thing that was fascinating is that in substance use disorders, many addiction, it's the environmental cues that trigger the craving and why people relapse. It's the stress that triggers the anxiety and that's why they relapse. And what we saw in the animal model was that it was decreasing this environmental cue triggers. They're now extending this research to humans who suffer from opioid addiction. Yasmin Hurd's lab has been able to replicate these effects in small, placebo-controlled clinical studies. We could see that it was those people who had gotten the CBD where their craving was reduced. But importantly, we also saw that their anxiety was reduced. That's what it works on. And that's what we need in, in addiction treatment. You know, we have a lot of substitution therapy, such as um, opioid agonists, such as methadone and buprenorphine, which are really important. But we don't really have medications that are targeting the thing that well, that's why many people will relapse, namely the craving and the anxiety. I didn't know how CBD works. Still don't. We're now back to looking at the mechanisms in this regard. I could Google any medical symptom. Literally, I've tried this. And there is someone out there on the internet who says that this CBD THC product will fix that specific treatment. How does that make you feel as a neuroscientist who is evidence-based? I'm scared. They're taking it lightly that something that can have potential medicinal value, it's disturbing because there are a lot of bad actors out there now that are selling CBD products, THC products. But I understand that when people are desperate because they're suffering or their loved one is suffering, they want to try anything and everything. But it's going to come back to, you know, 
rigorous clinical studies where we can understand what dose will be effective for certain disorders. But there's no medicine on this planet, even those that are considered like, you know, these gold standards that treats and cures everything that doesn't have side effects. So unless clinicians are guided with that kind of information, they're not going to be able to help their patients. Can CBD or can cannabis help some people? Absolutely. Is there clinical trials to prove that it does for the majority of things out there? No. Not yet, at least. Not yet. If we're going to call this medicine and we want to make it medicine, let it go through the process as all other medicines. At the end of the day, I want people to be safe. I decided to check out the cannabis dispensary close to my apartment in San Francisco. They had their cannabis retailer license for adult and medicinal use displayed right where you'll see it when you come in. And I gotta say, I am impressed. The employees were like really nice and helpful. And, and you know, it, they almost seem like bartenders, but they go by the term bud tenders. As expected, they have a lot of THC and CBD products, but they have products that have CBN, CBG, uh, THCV, Delta-8. Some of these cannabinoids, most people haven't heard of. And they have so many products. The kind you smoke, of course, and baked goods and candies, but also drinks, cooking oils, seasonings. I even saw shrimp chips. With so much out there, I asked some experienced consumers how they select their products and figure out what dose is right for them. To be honest, I have enough friends that consume cannabinoid products that I mostly um, pick my products based on word of mouth and if something is highly recommended by a friend. Everyone's needs, wants, experience levels are different. I would consult a bud tender. I actually went to a dispensary and spoke to a nurse practitioner about like anxiety and I have hyperthyroid. So um, she spoke to me about which types of uh, THC I should look for and the dosages and how much CBD I should have. When you talk to people about the potential therapeutic effects of this plant, you'll frequently hear that cannabis has been used for thousands of years. We're back with Ziva Cooper to talk through the science behind therapeutic claims for cannabis and how consumers can use it safely. But while I was doing research about the evidence supporting the medicinal effects of the plant, I noticed that there actually really wasn't much research that had been done in relation to the indications that people were using the plant for. But she says that body of research is growing. THC has been studied rigorously for many decades. And so we've learned a lot about THC's effects in people under these rigorous trials where you're comparing placebo to THC. But there's also a lot of information in studies that have employed cell models or animal models. For instance, can THC be helpful for pain? Can it be helpful to increase appetite? What happens when people use THC to help them sleep or to decrease anxiety? But we're also learning a lot about its effects in the brain and how different doses have different outcomes, how different effects can happen based off of how people use it, whether people are inhaling it or using it orally as a capsule, as a pill, or as a beverage. I think where science is kind of lagging behind right now is with all the different ways that people are starting to use this plant and products that are coming from the plant. For a lot of these different chemical constituents that people are using, we have very limited data to pull from to be able to understand what their effects are when given to people for different conditions or even when used for non-medical reasons. Many people turn to cannabis to treat pain. Ziva Cooper and her team investigated whether cannabis might help decrease dependence on opioids which are used for pain relief work that was inspired by studies in animals. The work that I do is very preliminary work in humans. And we were curious to see, based off of what we know in animals, 
if THC and cannabis might be helpful in amplifying the pain relieving effects of a very low dose of an opioid that isn't normally pain relieving. And so we did this type of study in humans and we found that cannabis with THC in it did in fact help to increase the pain relieving effects of the opioids. In theory, you can have somebody who's on a very low dose of an opioid, a dose of an opioid that doesn't have adverse effects, And if you were to add THC to it, you'd get significant pain relief. What we're working on now is understanding how other components of the cannabis plant might also be pain relieving in place of opioids. She says that anxiety is one of the top three reasons why people report using cannabis. And there is evidence suggesting that CBD cannabidiol the non-intoxicating component of the cannabis plant might be helpful for some types of anxiety. And there's conflicting evidence for THC. As I'm sure you hear from anecdotal reports, some people who use cannabis with THC in it get really anxious, whereas other people find that it's actually quite helpful for their anxiety. So this is also a very promising area of research It should be clear by now, when it comes to effects on the human body and brain, cannabis is really complicated. So where does that leave us in terms of regulation over all the cannabis products that are being offered in dispensaries and online? Every state has different regulations related to how cannabis and these products are handled. So in California, we have the legal cannabis market, which means that there are regulated dispensaries that are providing products according to LA counties or California states regulations. But we also have the unregulated market as well. A big aspect of this is labeling, how products have to be tested for heavy metals and mold and pesticides and How accurate is that label with respect to reporting how much THC is in that product, how much CBD is in that product? And so when somebody goes into a dispensary, they have to, A, understand if it's a regulated dispensary, if it's adhering to these testing protocols, and B, they have to be knowledgeable enough to understand what those labels actually mean. And that's a really big issue right now with consumer cannabis literacy. And so as scientists, we're trying to figure out all these effects, whether you use it as a topical or an edible or smoking or vaping. And in many states, people can just walk into dispensaries and not necessarily get guidance on which products to use. We're kind of leaving the responsibility up to the patient or up to the consumer. You know, some of these products are tricky. I'm sure you of all people have seen some of the candy bars that look like legit candy bars you can get over the counter, but they're like the marijuana counterpart. But it's difficult for people to tease this out. The cannabis products that are available for people to consume, how close those relate to the ones studied in labs? And I guess my question is is going into the difference between synthetic and plant-derived cannabis products? Like, what are we testing in labs in comparison to what people out there are actually getting? It really comes down to what are the chemicals in that natural product? So if somebody's using a candy bar or gets a gummy that has CBD in it, what are some of the other chemicals in there? How much THC is there in there? How much of other cannabinoids are in there that might be contributing to CBD's effects? And so that's different when we're talking about a synthetic or a isolate where you're just looking at CBD by itself. So although we can't, because of federal restrictions, necessarily go to the dispensary that's right down the block from my office and get the products, bring them into lab and test people with those products, we can kind of mimic what people are using by getting products that are federally available 
and, you know, sanctioned and be able to start looking at these in the laboratory. So we can look at natural CBD. We can look at natural THC. We can compare them to synthetic. However, the industry is quickly evolving. So it is hard for the science to keep up and be able to test all the new and novel ways that people are using it. And there's this hot new product, Delta 8 THC. That's different from the Delta 9 that we're familiar with. This is over the last six to eight months. This has become very popular. Uh, People are asking questions about it, but being able to study it in the lab is difficult in part because we have to be able to get access to some source of Delta 8 THC. So while people are self-experimenting, The scientists who can actually do the studies in the laboratory and compare Delta-8 THC to Delta-9 THC or compare it to placebo, we're trying to work hard to be able to get the funding to do that type of research, to be able to get the products so that we can actually feasibly do that research in the laboratory. And that leads to a lot of questions. And the scientist has to say, well, it depends, or well, we don't know, or well, let me get back to you in five years, which is frustrating for the community. There's also the question of the doses people use versus the doses that are actually studied in the lab. The cannabis that used to be available that has been rigorously studied in the lab was very low in THC concentrations. So let's say 3% THC, 6% THC. When you compare that to the 20% THC, 30% THC cannabis that you can get in the dispensary down the street, the effects you would expect are going to be quite different. When you ask people about their patterns of use and how much THC they're actually getting, a lot of people aren't necessarily aware or they're not necessarily thinking about the THC percent in the cannabis that they're buying. So from a scientific perspective, when I'm trying to figure out the impact of cannabis on behavior and physiology... I'm trying to get a sense of what people are using in Los Angeles, how much THC exposure they're getting on a day-to-day basis. But it's actually difficult because people don't necessarily even know themselves what they're using. Since 1970, cannabis has been prohibited under federal law as a Schedule I substance. The DEA defines Schedule I substances as drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Over the years, Local policymakers have started to see it differently, and the recreational use of cannabis is now legal in 19 states, Washington, D.C., and Guam. You know, people are looking for all different alternative sources to help their lives, and so this is a brand new booming industry that is interesting. It was stigmatized for a long time. It was illegal for decades. And now it's kind of like the gates have opened. So a lot of people are very much intrigued by it. Now there's a push in Congress to change its legal status at a federal level. Here's Senator Chuck Schumer, who introduced the bill. This is monumental because at long last, we are taking steps in the Senate to right the wrongs of the failed war on drugs. The war on drugs has really been a war on people, particularly people of color. Yasmin Hurd supports undoing decades of damage to communities that have been disproportionately harmed by this criminalization. Absolutely no cannabis should be criminalized. But she does have some issues with how cannabis policy has been implemented. She cites the 2018 Farm Bill, which legalized hemp, a variety of cannabis with no more than a 0.3% concentration of THC, as well as any part of that plant. That includes cannabinoids like CBD, but only CBD derived from hemp. But it's a little ridiculous because CBD from the regular cannabis plant is also CBD, so it should also not be scheduled. So it's crazy that cannabis-derived CBD is still scheduled, but not hemp-derived CBD. And we do need one federal policy, and they should let science dictate it. So the fact that Epidiolex has been now approved as a medicine already tells you that CBD should not be listed as, you know, addictive. And so what's your biggest concern as we legalize it? My major concern is the aspect of dose. Because there was no dose limit when they legalized um, cannabis in certain states, in the majority of states now, 
that does become a problem because now it's unlimited. These high potency extracts that people sometimes refer to as dabs, wax, shatter. So when you go into dispensaries in many states, you can get these products that are almost 100% THC. We've come a far away from the plant itself. They have not been studied in the laboratory under rigorous procedures. And so people are using these very high potency products. So this is blowing out your cannabis receptors in your body and brain. Yasmin Heard believes we can offer appropriate guidance on dosage without criminalizing those who use it. So I think that there are certain things that the federal government can still do to um, regulate aspects of dose within a, a frame that you know, people want to do for recreational use, but limits the psychiatric vulnerability and the health risk that we see that comes with the higher doses of THC. Chemistry is chemistry. Come on, federal government. Nova Now is a production of GBH and PRX. It's produced by Terrence Bernardo, Ari Daniel, Jocelyn Gonzalez, Isabel Hibbard, Sandra Lopez Monsalve, and Rosalind Tordesillas. Julia Court and Chris Schmidt are the co executive producers of Nova. Suki Bennett is senior digital editor. Christina Monin is associate researcher. Robin Kasmer is science editor. Robert Boyd is digital associate producer. And Devin Robbins is managing producer of podcasts at GBH. Our theme music is by the DJ who keeps the energy high and smokes all competition. That's DJ Kid Koala. I'm Alok Patel. We'll be back in two weeks, which is more than enough time for you to look up all the different cannabinoids out there. Yeah, there's CBD and THC, but there's also CBCVA, CBLA, CBDC1, CBNC4, Delta-8 THCA, Delta-9 THC, Delta-9 THCVA, OTHC... There's even 3456-tetrahydro, 7-hydroxy, alpha-alpha, 2-trimethyl, 9-n-propyl, 2,6-methanol, 2-H1-benzoxacin, 5-methanol. Say that three times fast. If you want to learn even more about the science behind cannabis, which I know you do, watch Nova's The Cannabis Question, the film streaming now on the PBS video app and Nova's YouTube channel. GBH.